The first thing you'll notice about Imperial of 1961 is its striking headlight treatment and its crisply formal grill. This is what we think a fine car should look like, a fresh interpretation of the basic Imperial concept. And this is why I think this is a Frankenstein car. Welcome everyone to a new review here on Ed Sauter Reviews, which is also kind of like a design analysis of this car right here. The 1961 Imperial LeBaron, the Frankenstein of the forward look. To fully understand what led to the creation of a car that features such an outlandish design with soaring fins and freestanding headlights, we have to take a quick look at history. This is Chrysler in the early 1950s, perfectly portrayed by this black 1953 Chrysler Imperial. And I already see you as a viewer to be rather confused because I use Chrysler, I use Imperial, Chrysler Imperial. What is going on? Well, to keep it very simple, before the mid 50s, Chrysler would sell the Chrysler Imperial, which was their top of the line car, the top of the line model. And after the mid 50s, they decided to spin off and make it a separate brand. So Imperial became a separate brand with its own models. This black 1953 Imperial is a beautiful example of the boringness that are the early 1950s Chrysler. From a distance, it kind of looks like a Cadillac, but up close you will see that oh, it's just another Chrysler. It's, it's fine, but it starts to lag behind. It looks very friendly and, uh, and round, but the competition was trying to square off their cars and Chrysler was lagging behind. In order to steer the ship away from Boring Bay, Chrysler hired car designer Virgil Exner. And Virgil Exner had a plan to bring Chrysler back into the picture. Step one was to generate excitement and attention through concept cars at the big motor shows. Virgil came up with the so-called Chrysler Dream Cars or Idea Cars. One-off concept cars that had either radical styling or what I think is the perfect blend between European elegance and American style. Chrysler had some close contact with the Italian coach Bobergia, who designed the bodies, just to give them some of that little extra magic. Step two is to take some of that magic from the concept cars and trickle it down on regular production cars, such as this 1956 DeSoto Firefly. And you know what? Make some bold claims while you're at it. There you are, the all-new, all-American beauty. And it's all wonderful. Chrysler's new $100 million look. This $100 million look actually went both ways. It was one way for Chrysler to advertise that they, well, they've spent $100 million worth of development money on creating these fantastic, wonderful, futuristic cars, but at the same time also convince you that you didn't just buy any ordinary Dodge or DeSoto in this case, that was, you know, a, a well-priced car. No, you bought a car that at the same time looked 100 million times more expensive than it actually was. And this DeSoto has this quintessential mid-1950s design, which I absolutely love. It's a perfect blend of, of everything. You still got that kind of like the touch of early 50s in the front end with the singular headlights instead of dual headlights and, the, and kind of like the fish mouth uh, grill. But at the same time, the rear end is already ready for the 1960s. No soft sloping rear fenders like you'd find on the, uh, the black 53 Imperial right behind me, but some slight hint of already soaring fins triple tail lights that uh, kind of look like traffic lights and an interior that makes you feel like you are an astronaut. Step 3 came around in 1957 when Exner went in overdrive. He swapped the 100 million dollar look for a new slogan, the forward look. The world of tomorrow, today. Fins became higher, roofs were lowered and headlights were doubled, giving the cars an almost cartoonesque appearance but in a good way. Truly rocket ships on wheels, and among my all-time favorite Chrysler cars ever made. But then came uh, step four, and here is where it gets interesting. See, what was step four exactly? Um, well, I always like to think Chrysler couldn't handle the pressure of being a styling leader instead of a follower, and so around 1960 their cars started to feature more and more bizarre designs. I won't go too much into detail, as I've already done this before, but in that video I called the 1961 Imperial the worst of them all. 
And here I am standing right next to the 1961 Imperial LeBaron, the flagship model of the flagship brand of the Chrysler Corporation. And today I want to just dive a bit deeper into the design of the car, as there is a lot more going on than what initially meets the eye. Because, get this, if you want to operate in the American luxury car segment, you should come in heavy or not at all. And Chrysler did that. For starters, this is America's most carefully built car. Uh, that was the bold claim of the day. In fact, Imperials rode on a special X-frame that proved to be so rock solid that many Imperials were a popular choice in banger racing. But according to the legend, eventually they were banned because they were too strong. So the foundations for a strong, solid ride were secured, thanks to Chrysler's engineering background. But you're not going to win it on underpinnings alone. You also need a strong, solid name that signifies importance, luxury. And so, Imperial, it sounds, it sounds high class, it sounds regal, royal. But not only that, because this car, the top of the line model, is called LeBaron. Which gives it a sense of um, Old world continental Europe, right? Le Baron. It sounds French, much like Riviera or Monte Carlo or some other car names that were used by some other car makers. Well, you're wrong. This is no reference to Europe whatsoever. Le Baron, as it is pronounced the correct way, Le Baron, is actually a reference to the coach builder, Le Baron. See, LeBaron was a coach builder that did a lot of work for some of the uh, car companies and it switched hands many times. It was bought and sold and bought again by Chrysler in the mid-1950s. Think of it as the same way as Cadillac used to have the Fleetwood, which was also a coach builder. And it all comes together in this badge. According to the stories or legend, uh, Chrysler finished this badge in such a way that it was deemed like an actual jewel by the U.S. government. So this, it's a badge, but it was considered a jewel by the U.S. government. And because of that, Chrysler had to pay extra in Texas to get it on the car. And it just shows you those extra little steps these American car companies took to really make the cars great. Inside, feast your eyes upon what is arguably one of the most outlandish interior designs of the late 50s and early 60s, if ever. These were the years Chrysler dashboards across the divisions were all unique, with such space-age gimmicks like the Astrodome dashboard that is lit up at night through the panelescent lighting. It's even more astonishing if you compare it to last year's Imperial dashboard, which was also radical and completely different with two massive gauges. But this year, they decided to take the rear end of a 1957 DeSoto as main inspiration. The men who build Imperial believe that a fine car should be elegant, with rich, hand-fitted fabrics and leathers, that it should be luxurious, with soft, deep foam-padded seats, that its passenger compartment should be spacious. Now let me guide you through the interior and the dashboard, as there is, there is a lot going on, but it's also a great way to tell just how luxurious this car was back in the day. Because here we go. Right in front of me, I am greeted by a horizontal speedometer. And right below that, I got four gauges, oil pressure, battery, temperature, and fuel. And right below that, in the middle, a clock. How convenient. And right below that, four round pots, each with their own function. On my left, my lights. Then I got my wipers. And on my right, I have the place where I put the, uh, the key in for the ignition. And also, autopilot. And you might wonder, what the hell is that? Well, that is cruise control. The ultra luxury option of the day. This is one of the very first cars to have cruise control. Pretty standard stuff today, but quite luxurious back in the 50s and the 60s. And right below that, I got my rear air and floor air. Because guess what? This car also comes with air conditioning. It is uh, controlled on the right side. There's this massive vertical trim piece which operates the air conditioning. So if you want to cool or warm the car and also set the fan speed. And on my left, the other vertical, massive vertical trim piece is the automatic transmission, which is push-button operated. If you think that today's cars are very futuristic with their push-button transmission, like those EVs, 
you're wrong. Chrysler already had them in the 1950s. And this wasn't just an imperial thing. Uh, Chrysler had them across all the cars, including, you know, the, the cheaper uh, uh, Plymouths and, and Dodges. And right in front of me, I have an oval steering wheel instead of a regular round one. This was another one of Chrysler's brilliant ideas. They thought if we make them a bit lower, you can see the road better and you can see the speedometer better because it is very thin. Uh, but the people weren't really all that um, happy about it and they, they scrapped it after a couple of years. Although you, you kind of see it right now in modern cars where they, you know, they cut off the lower lower end of the, of the steering wheel. So in some way Chrysler was right. I also want to grab your attention to talk about what is going on down at your feet. It's a bit hard to see, but you'll find two buttons and a pedal. And that makes you wonder, what is that third pedal for? Is it a clutch? No, it's not a clutch, because like I just explained, this car is an automatic and many American cars were during these days, so this is no clutch. Now this is your foot operated parking brake. Um, there are still some modern day cars out there that also have this system. So instead of like the uh, lever that you have in your own car, here you have a foot operated uh, parking brake. So you push in the pedal and then you have activated the parking brake. And if you want to release it, there is also a little handle down here. You pull it and then you have released the parking brake. But it still leaves us with two buttons. Now some older viewers that are watching might recognize at least one of those buttons. Because the first button is the automatic headlight dimmer. So when you're driving down a dark road, someone is coming up to you, then you can gently push the button on the floor and the headlights will dim automatically. But then we are still left with one extra button, which makes you wonder, what is it about? Well, that is for the, and get this, automated seeking device. So if you push the button on the floor, the radio will automatically seek or skip to the next radio station. I mean, how awesome is that? This is all pretty much standard stuff in today's cars, but it was considered quite a luxury back in the day. Uh, it is still a bit confusing, however. Those buttons are quite close to each other, so imagine that you, you know, want to dim your headlights, and next thing you know, you switch to the rock and roll station, which you don't like because it's the music of the devil. But you can forget all these gimmicks, luxuries, and equipment, because if a car doesn't look the part, it won't grab the attention. But fortunately, it does. I think it's a love or hate type of car. Maybe it's a design that can grow on you. But above all, it is certainly unique. Like I said, these were the days when Chrysler was losing it. And you can see it in this car. It has a bipolar disorder. And what I mean by that is that the car is futuristic, all right? It has all the 50s ingredients, bullet-shaped taillights, the fins, lower roof light, etc. And yet, Exner was crazy enough to introduce some retro design elements. Don't believe me? First of all, what is arguably the most recognizable styling element of the entire car, the freestanding headlights, which are presumed to be designed after the freestanding headlights that you'd commonly find on cars from the 1930s and 40s. But also, the turning signals mounted right above it, which give the car somewhat of a eyebrow look. The taillights are also just as unique and follow the same design. They are also freestanding, hanging from the tail fin above. Second is the formal roof design. In the day and age when the bubble top was the name of the game, the Imperial featured a formal roof design with a formal C-pillar with a chrome strip sweeping down from the top of the roof down to the C-pillar. Especially in the LeBaron, you would get a smaller limousine-style rear window that was once again a throwback to cars from the 1930s. And last but not least, the rear Continental Tire Kit, uh, which was quickly nicknamed the Toilet Seat. You can figure out yourself. This is a fake, however. If you open the trunk, you'll find that the tire is located flat on itself somewhere in the corner and not mounted right here where it is. And it truly shows that this is more show than go. Just designing things that don't have any function whatsoever. But as long as it looks, you know, good. And same can be said about the tail fins, which also don't have any function whatsoever. With these aspects in mind, I hereby make the bold claim that the 1961 Imperial might actually be one of the very first cars ever to feature retro design, inspired by the cars that were 20 years old at the time. This idea is reinforced by the fact that after Exner was fired because of these dubious designs in the early 60s, he continued to make sketches for the so-called revival cars, featuring a lot of classical details and references to the 1930s. Many of these styling elements would later be adopted by the late 1960s and the 70s with the Great Brougham Epoch. 
and found their way to many American cars. And that might make this Imperial even more futuristic than it already is. This car came out in a time when futurism and modernism were all the rage. And to come out with a car that already features design elements that are considered retro, well, that was ridiculed right from the start. I mean, park this next to a 1961 Lincoln Continental and it'll stick out like a sore thumb. And so that's why I call this the Frankenstein of the forward look. The Imperial for 61, despite its many qualities, is a car which cannot decide whether it wants to belong in the 60s or the 30s. Virgil got burned for that and lost his job, but this car also shows the true genius of Virgil Exner, a very early example of retro styling. Always a step ahead of the competition, whether this competition realized it or not. And so this is the forward look that has run its course. This is the backward look. Suddenly, it is 1930. I want to thank Laumann's Toyota World for giving me this awesome opportunity to tell the story of these three cars. Laumann is the official importer of Toyota here in the Netherlands and used to import Chrysler products before that, hence the cars. They have various museums throughout the country, with their own unique collection on display. Go check it out next time you visit Holland. The links are in the description.